Welcome to Cibolo Creek. Let's all stand up together and worship. We're gonna celebrate. Yeah, we're gonna celebrate this morning. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. It was my turn till I met you. Come on, you call my name. You call my name. nasty outside, but we got a lot to celebrate in here. So thank you guys for joining us today at Civil Oak Creek. Whether you're at home or in the room, we're so excited that you joined us. We are going to be celebrating communion a little later on. So if you're at home, uh, you guys have something under your seats, but if you're at home, you can uh, got time, a little time to go grab the things that you need. Paul will be leading that a little later on. Uh, before we get into worship, guys, it's been a crazy week. I don't know what your week was like. I don't know how much of the news you watched or 
what's been going on in your life, but I just want to encourage you guys. God loves you. He loves you right where you are. And guys, we're gathered here because he cares for us. We are his sons. We are his daughters. And of all the voices that are coming into our heads, that are coming into our ears, that are being thrown at us, there's only one voice that matters, and it's his voice. So let's, let's embrace him now. Let's worship him, and let's listen for his voice.
child of God. Let's embrace that identity, guys. We are sons and daughters. We don't have to fear anything. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. And I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. Come on, I'm no longer a slave. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And I'm no longer voices one more time no longer a slave I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God come on declare that I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a 
child of God. Amen. Amen. You guys have a seat. Good morning. How are you today? Do you all know what a pluviophile is? That's a real word. A pluviophile is somebody who loves it when it rains. Any pluviophiles in the room? Yeah, I'm a pluviophile. Now, when it rains and is cold, that's kind of a different story. And it tends to make people a little grouchy and grumpy. So let me ask you, what kind of mood are you in today? Are you in a good mood? Because I need you to be in a good mood because today I'm going to stretch you a little. Today I'm going to ask you to think outside of some boxes. I'm going to ask you to challenge some uh, paradigms that we typically think in regards to certain subjects. So today I invite you to be willing to think some things in some ways that perhaps you've never considered them before. Um, There are times that I'd love to begin a message this way. Now, where were we? I would love to be able to just pick up right where we left off from last Sunday because these series of messages that we do, they're one thought build on another. And the problem with that is that I never have the same audience in the same room two weeks in a row, whether that's online or here in the, in the room. And so um, some of you, you weren't here last week. So you don't know what we talked about last Sunday. And some of you were here last week and you don't know what we talked about last Sunday. Um, But here's the deal. We, we, We started with a look at an encounter that Jesus had with his disciples. And the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him, would you teach us to pray? And what I found so interesting is that of all the things that Jesus could have taught his disciples about prayer... He chose one that was particularly interesting. And he says, when you pray, I want you to say this, our father in heaven. So again, of all of the things that Jesus could have impressed upon the minds of his disciples about prayer, he says, the first and most important thing is that when you talk to God, I want you to think of him as your father in heaven I want you to understand the nature of your relationship with him as he is your father and you are his child. Now, another interesting encounter in the life of Jesus, a gentleman by the name of Nicodemus once came to talk with Jesus under the cover of darkness. You see, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a member of a very elite religious group, and uh, they didn't like Jesus. They didn't agree with Jesus. They didn't want Jesus around. And so Nicodemus, he wanted to talk to Jesus, but he didn't want anybody to see them having a conversation. So he arranged to meet Jesus at night. And Nicodemus comes to ask Jesus some questions about faith and about God and about eternal life and about the kingdom of God. And it's interesting, the discussion that they have. And at one point in the discussion, Jesus replied to Nicodemus. He says, very truly, I tell you. In other words, pay attention. This is very important. Very truly, I tell you that no one, no one can see the kingdom of God, eternal life, heaven. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Unless they are born again. Now, remember, Nicodemus is part of a religious class of people who would have thoroughly understood the Jewish scriptures. And yet he didn't track with Jesus. How, how, how can someone be born, born again? How can they be born when they're old? 
How can you be born again like when you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, when they're old? And Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. You see, Nicodemus failed to grasp one very important truth about life. And that is that whenever you're in a conversation with Jesus, you must understand that Jesus always sees everything from a different perspective. You see, we look at life from a physical perspective, what we can taste and touch and see and smell. But in the mind and the heart of Jesus, he understands that there's a spiritual dimension to everything in life. There's another dimension that has to do with the soul with the spirit of a human being that's different from that which is purely physical. You and I, we would do well to understand that whenever we're in a conversation with Jesus, that we have to appreciate that he always sees everything from a spiritual perspective and not just from a physical perspective. Some of you, some of us, we're looking at the world right now from a political perspective. We see things that's happening in our nation from a physical or political perspective, and we're completely missing the spiritual dimension to what's unfolding in our nation. And there is one. You look at your family and your marriage and all that's going on there from a strictly physical perspective, and you're missing the spiritual dimension of what's unfolding in your marriage or in your home. Some of you, you're, you're looking at your financial portfolio from a physical perspective and you're just doing the math and you're looking at the accounts and you're making decisions and determining priorities around what you think you're worth and you're missing the spiritual dimension of your worth and your finances and the relationship to it. Nicodemus, when Jesus said you must be born again, he was looking at it from a completely physical perspective. He's like, how does a person who's old be born a second time? You can't get back in your mother's womb. And Jesus said, no, I'm talking about a spiritual birth. I'm talking about a birth that takes place in a different dimension. We would go on to understand that when a person places their faith, their trust in Jesus Christ, they are born again. They are born spiritually in a way that they become alive to God. Another discussion happens in the book of John, John's gospel. John says this, to all who receive Jesus, Jesus is the one being talked about in the context, to all who invite Jesus in, who welcome Jesus, to all who receive Jesus, to those who believe in his name, to those who trust who Jesus is, those who receive Jesus, to those who believe on his name, he, Jesus, gives them the right, the privilege to become children of God. Physical, spiritual, not children born of natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will. No, we're talking about children who are born spiritually. Again, People who place their faith in Jesus Christ as their savior are born again and they become the sons and daughters of God. The inference here is that someone who has not received Jesus, has not been born again, does not become one of God's children. So here's... The premise from which I'm working throughout this series is that by faith in Jesus Christ, God is our father. When you pray, pray like this, our father who is in heaven. God is our father. By faith in Jesus Christ, we are adopted into God's family. We become his sons and his daughters. As his sons and daughters, we are God's children. He's our father, we are his children. And the truth that I'm exploring in this series is that because we are God's children by faith in Jesus Christ, that makes us brothers and sisters to one another. We are family. So you're ready to be stretched a little? You're ready to think outside of the boxes of our typical paradigms of how we consider certain subjects. So I'm gonna invite you to look at a discussion that Jesus has that expands 
our traditional definition of what it means to be a family. So we read about this in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's account of the life of Jesus. It says this, while Jesus was still talking to the crowd, so Jesus is with a group of people. We don't know how large of a crowd it was. We do know that it was inside, so it might have been a smaller crowd. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and his brothers stood outside, outside of wherever Jesus was teaching, and they wanted to speak to him. So somebody came into the house and someone told Jesus, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside. They want to speak to you. Now we get this. His mother, we, we, we know who his mother is. His mother's name was Mary. It says his brothers are standing. We know of one brother that Jesus had. His name was James. So his mother and his brothers are wanting to see Jesus. And then we read this. And Jesus replied to the person who came in to say, your mother and your brothers are here. Jesus says, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, here, here are my mother and my brothers. In other words, here's my family. For whoever does the will of God or the will of my Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, they are my brother and my sisters and my mother. You see, at times Jesus said things in a certain way to help people think about some things in ways they've never thought about them before. Now, a lot of people read that passage and they think, well, Jesus was kind of rude. He's kind of inconsiderate. He was insensitive to his mom. Who's your mother and who's your brother? He was sort of rude to his family. But here's the problem with that is that Jesus is God come to earth and he can't be rude. Jesus can't be insensitive. He can't be inconsiderate. So perhaps there's another way to interpret how Jesus was responding in this situation. You see, he wasn't being rude to his mother or his brothers. He was being a teacher. He posed the question in a way to get his audience to think, to think differently, to think outside of the box of how they traditionally understood mother and brothers. So maybe Jesus wasn't being inconsiderate at all. Maybe he was just being philosophical, maybe Socratic. Maybe he was even playing. So they come into the room and they say, hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here. And Jesus, perhaps very playful, said, really? So, so who are my brothers and who is my mother? And that would have caused his audience to stop and think, well, physically, we know your mother and your brothers. And Jesus always talked about things from a spiritual perspective. And he's saying, yes, I want you to rethink how you think of family. You see, anybody who shares a common bond of doing the will of God, anybody who shares a common bond of faith in me, they are my family. They are my mother and my brothers and my sisters. So perhaps, perhaps Jesus wants us to rethink what it means to be family. Maybe he wants us to rethink who our brothers and our sisters are. So I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. I'm going to make it weird in the room for a few minutes. You ready? You ready? You're saying, well, how weird is it going to get? I want to ask you to look around. Turn in your chair if you need to. I want, I want you to actually lock eyes with other people in the room. Those of you who for some reason are sitting so far away from me on this side. Oh, here's Colleen. I would like this side to stand up. And I want you to look at the people over on the far side of the room. Okay, thank you. Those of you who are on this side of the room, I'd like to ask you to stand up. I'd like you to look at the people on that far side of the room. All right, thank you. You may be seated. Those of you in the center, I'll let you off the hook. So who are these people? 
Are they just some people that you go to church with? Are they just some people that you don't really know all that well? They just happen to go to the same church at the same service at the same time that you do? Or are they, are they your brothers and your sisters because of a shared faith in Jesus Christ and an understanding of God as your heavenly father? You see, if we just show up at church and we just sit around with some other people who happen to go to the same church, it's easy to say, I'm not going to get really involved. I'm not going to become really familiar with those people that always sit over on the other side of the room. I'm, I'm not going to cross paths with them. Maybe I'll give them a quick wave, a, a bump, fist bump or handshake if they ask us to. I might nod and say, hey, how you doing? But I'm I'm not going to necessarily pursue a relationship with them that would be on the level of a brother or a sister. And when we make that mistake, we miss. We miss how Jesus understood what it means to be a family with one another who are in the pursuit of faith in God. Folks, this language is all through the New Testament. I, I could take you to far too many places than we have time for, so I'm just going to show you a couple of them. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is writing to a, a letter to the church at Ephesus. That church was living in the turmoil and the tension of there were Jewish people who'd become Christians and there were Gentile people who'd become Christians and Jews and Gentiles didn't like each other. They didn't do life together with one another very well. And the Jews kind of felt like they had this spiritual advantage because they were God's chosen people and the Gentiles sort of felt like outcasts. And the apostle Paul writes a letter to the church and goes, no, 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 in Christ, in Christ, it's all changed. Consequently, you who are Gentiles, you're no longer foreigners. You're no longer strangers. No, you're fellow citizens. You're a part of the kingdom of God. You're fellow citizens with God's people. And also you are members of his what? His household. What is that? You are members of God's family. If somebody's taking a survey and they ask you the question, how many people are in your household what number do you give them? You give them the number of the family that lives in your home. So he's saying, Gentiles, you're no longer outcasts or strangers, but because of your faith in Jesus Christ, the same faith that some Jews have come to understand Jesus as their Messiah, you are now members of God's family. First Timothy, Apostle Paul writes, although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that in case I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's what? Household, his family, which is the church. You see, in the apostle Paul's mind, his understanding of the church was that it's a family that belongs to God. The church, which is the, of the living God, which is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. Galatians, Paul writes, let us not become weary in doing good things, helpful things, loving things, compassionate things. Let's not become weary in doing good for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't quit or give up. Therefore, he writes to the church, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, but especially let's be attentive to doing good to those who belong to the family of believers, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles who share a relationship with Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you as brothers and sisters, that in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. You see, that's how a healthy family behaves as they stay united together in what it is that they're about. So I think this is interesting that in the New Testament, the church, the church is addressed as brothers and sisters, a total of 128 times. 
The phrase brothers and sisters occurs 132 times, four of them found in the Old Testament. But the language of the New Testament is that the church is always referred to as brothers and sisters. The church is a family. The math is this, that Christians, not people who go to church, but people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their savior, they become Christ followers. A gathering of Christians is what's called a church. And the church is a family. It's absolutely integral to our spiritual health that you and I understand the nature of our relationship to one another, not simply as people who go to the same church, but as brothers and sisters who are united together by our bond of faith in Jesus Christ. Are you ready to be stretched some more? Look at this interesting discussion. Jesus once had this uh, conversation and he says, it is written, man shall not live, woman shall not live by bread alone. But on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus in this conversation is saying, we do not simply live based on the food that we eat. There's also another dimension, and that is the truth that comes from the mouth of God that's important to our survival. So what's he talking about? Again, Jesus always talked about spiritual things in relationship to physical realities. So he's again contrasting physical and spiritual. He's talking about what's temporal versus what's eternal, what's limited and bound by time and what will last for an eternity. He's talking about what's familiar, meaning what we can touch and taste and see. It's, it's in our realm of experience. And yet he's talking also about that realm outside of the familiar, that's faith where God declares certain things to be true, and we may not be able to prove them by touch, taste, sight, but they are true because God has declared them. So, Jesus, in response to this conversation, he's talking about two different worlds. He says, human beings do not simply live by the food that they eat, but they also thrive because they are more than simply physical beings. They thrive on the truth of God and his word. So here's the equation. In the same way that our body needs food, our soul, that spiritual dimension of who we are, our soul needs to be fed. And what Jesus is alerting us to is that what feeds our soul is different from what nourishes our body. Okay, so now we make the logical leap. And that is that Jesus is talking about family. And you and I, when we hear the word family, we think of natural blood-related relatives, mom, dad, sister, brothers, aunts and uncles, grandparents. Jesus would say, man does not live by his natural family alone. In the same way that we need a physical family, our soul needs a spiritual family. You and I as spiritual beings, we need a spiritually oriented family in our life because what our spiritual family provides is different from what our natural family offers. We must recognize that God has designed us as human beings in a way that in order for our soul to thrive, we must be connected together with other brothers and sisters who share our faith in Jesus Christ. We can't simply just attend church. We are invited into the adventure and the experience of being a family to one another and all that comes with that. So church, church is a family. It's not a building. It's not a service that we attend. It's not a thing that we do for religious purposes. Church in the heart and the mind of God and Jesus and the writers of the New Testament, church is about brothers and sisters who share a relationship with Jesus Christ. So if that's true, then you and I, we have to figure out how does a church family work? What does a church family do and what doesn't a church family do? And what are the needs that a church family provides for our soul that our human natural family never could? And that's 
what I want to explore with you in the next two weeks of the series is what does it mean for a church to be a family? Now, it's possible that you'd say, well, Paul, you know, I'm not really all that interested. I, I kind of like my connection to my natural family and they're sort of my priority and I'm not going to make a big fuss over my spiritual family because that just sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> But here's what I'm going to tell you is that you better, you better settle in for the long haul because your spiritual brothers and sisters will be your family for an eternity. And God is inviting us to explore the realities of what it is to be a spiritual family to one another. And Jesus is asking us to understand that when we think family, we don't simply think of our brothers and sisters naturally but also our brothers and our sisters spiritually. And we'll talk more about that next Sunday. But today we wanted to reserve some time in our service for communion. So those of you who are in the room, the elements for communion are underneath your seat. Those of you who are joining us online, you are welcome to use anything that you can eat and anything that you can drink to be a part of our communion experience here today. So it's interesting to me. There are two places in the New Testament that teach us or provide instructions for communion. We've received some instructions from Jesus himself when he established the practice of communion with his disciples. The only other place in the New Testament that we have instructions about communion are in the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. And when Paul writes to the church at Corinth about communion, he was writing words of admonishment. You see, what was happening in the church at Corinth was they weren't acting much like a family. They weren't acting like brothers and sisters when it came to communion. You see, communion was intended by Jesus to be something that united us all together. But in the church at Corinth, communion was part of a larger meal. And what was happening in the church is that some people were showing up early and they were eating all the good food and just leaving the leftovers or sometimes not leaving enough for brothers and sisters who were arriving a little bit later. And Paul saw that as incredibly inconsiderate and selfish. So he admonishes the church. That when you gather together for communion, you're gathering together as a family, brothers and sisters who wait on each other in order for everybody to participate. It's interesting, when we think of family or we talk to family, we talk about being related by blood. Well, don't miss the fact that as Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are related by blood. It's just, it's not the blood of our lineage. It's the blood of our savior, Jesus Christ, that was shed on our behalf. And all of us who share faith in Jesus Christ, we are knitted together around the blood of Jesus that was shed for us as a payment for our sin. And communion, communion was established as a way to remind us again to come back to that place where we all start, the cross where Jesus shed his blood on our behalf. So this morning, we're gonna celebrate communion together as a reminder, oh, that's right. Through the blood of Jesus, we are all the sons and daughters of God and through faith in Christ, we are all brothers and sisters. You guys are smart, you know how this works off the top for a cracker. There's no magic in this cracker. Jesus, when he established communion, he said, I'm just gonna take a piece of bread and I want it to be a symbol. I want it to jog your memory. I want your mind to go to a certain place every time that you take this bread. I want this cracker, this bread, whatever it is that you might be using, I want it to remind you that Jesus died in your place. That you're the sinner and you should have died for your sin, but Jesus willingly died in your place. Don't ever forget that. That's why the instructions are as often as you eat this bread, 
do this in remembrance of Jesus. a cup again no magic in the cup the power is in what it represents the apostle Paul taught us in his instructions to the church at Corinth that this this cup was a reminder for our heart and our mind to recall that God made a covenant with his son Jesus that God, who is holy and righteous and just, would accept the death of Jesus on the behalf, as a payment on the behalf of the sins of the whole world, of which mine are a part. So the cup reminds us that God has offered us the gift of his forgiveness because of the blood that Jesus shed as a payment for sin. So as often as you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of Christ. Communion is intended to take us back to the cross where Jesus shed his blood as a payment for sin. And my trust in what Jesus did on my behalf is what allows me the privilege of being adopted into God's family as his son, or in your case, perhaps his daughter. For as many as received Jesus to them, he gave the right to be called the children of God. And if we are God's children and he is our father, then we are brothers and sisters. And we are family. Let me ask you to stand together. Let me pray for you. Our father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the reminder of communion. Thank you for the reminder of the scriptures and what they teach us about you and your son, Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that through the death of Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood as a payment for sin, that by faith and trust in it, I and we have been adopted into your family as your sons and your daughters. We are brothers and sisters. So may the cross unite us together as a family. And we ask, Father, that you would do a work in our hearts. The church would be so much more than a place that we go to on Sundays. But that it would be a place that we gather together with our brothers and our sisters, our family. Do that work in us, I pray and ask in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you guys for being here today. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.